praise Yah. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Welcome again to our afternoon study. And just, you know, just to reflect what we've already studied together, what we've already witnessed together, going through the Gospels, supermoniously, all four at the same time, chronologically putting them together, I think is an awesome way to do them. And uh, thank you, Brother Rick, for that guidance. And just what we're getting out of, you know, just what we're seeing out of it, just what we're gaining in understanding and how we're certainly more and more, we're able to clarify the center of all things is the Torah and all things point to the Yahushua Messiah, son of Elohim. So I just praise Yah for um, also the children's ministries and the ladies that put that together week after week, the great work that they're doing. Um, just listening to the children, you know, listening to them pray, um, you know, listening to them, you know, get excited about reading, about participating, you know, and then and then their 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 knowledge, their their, their young wisdom, you know, the the light that's in their eyes. Um, it's a beautiful thing to witness, and we're excited, you know, going forward. Just what Yah is going to do in our fellowship. Um, so now um, we're continuing our journey through the Torah, um, and we find ourselves in uh, the Book of Numbers. Um, and we, we know from previous uh, uh, week, uh, last two weeks, looking at chapters one and two, we know that we're around two years and two months out of Egypt, right? You know, the end of Exodus being one year, and this is another year after that. So we're two years, two months out of deliverance from Egypt, um, we find ourselves in the book of Numbers. And this book is interesting in that from the very beginning, just from the name, just from the name of the book, Numbers, um, we looked at it in the Greek, um, arithmoi, uh, meaning counting or numbering. Um, the Latin is numeri, actually where we get numbers from, and the, the Hebrew, Bamidbar, literally meaning in the wilderness. And we look at the book of Numbers and we see this eight, 38 year time of wandering in the, in the wilderness due to the lack of, of the faith of the children of Israel and disobedience. Um, so, so this time frame, this 38 year time frame chronicles um, the successes and failures, and, and I'm so glad that, you know, scripture looks at successes and failures. It gives us a picture of all that is entailed in living for Yah, that there's gonna be some successes and we have to be able to point those out. We have to be able to point the good things out in people, in the things that they're doing, um, specifically for Yah, you know, before we, you know, mention their failures. You know, because I think one hand watches the other in regards to what success is. Success is sometimes trial and error in the multitude of many failures coming to the understanding of success. Scripturally, when we look at it, we see that the failures come from more times than not disobeying or misunderstanding the instructions of Yah. So, we want to make sure that we're understanding clearly what Yah is saying to us uh, through uh, these books. And, you know, we understand, you know, as we looked at chapter one, we saw the numbering of the nations um, in regards to war. The numbers we saw were men that were ready to fight. And we saw the organization of those armies. We also saw in chapter two, we saw the setup of the camp, which surrounded um, the tabernacle. Um, so we see the, the we see the warfare, right? 
we see uh, now as we're going into chapter three, we're gonna start seeing worship and we're gonna see service because we're gonna see the priests and we're gonna see the Levites and we're gonna distinct, distinctly look at those two terms, priests and Levites. Um, so, so the book of warfare, you know, and we looked at, you know, as we looked at the names of the leaders of the tribes and we saw the phrases that the names meant, we saw that everything that their names represent not only showed the character of the men that were leading those, those, those Israelites, but it also showed us everything that we need in this thing called life. You know, we need to know that our brother is there for us. We need to know that Yah provides all things for, for us. We need to know that he is our salvation, that he is our help, that he is our shelter, that he is our protection. Those are all the same things that the children needed as they went into battle. Um, so then we looked at the ordering and the setup of the camp in the way that it not only surrounded uh, the tabernacle, but the way that the, the numbers were so that they could march in the correct way. So that the, the Judah would be first and thus and so everybody else fell, falls in order. So now we're gonna look at the duties of the Levites and the moving of the tabernacle as we go into to chapter three. But, but all things point to Messiah when we looked at the tabernacle, right? Remember, Exodus Leviticus, we already have a clear picture of what the tabernacle was. But before we get started, I just want to, you know, highlight a few things that we looked at, you know, that are very, I'm not going to call out passages that we already went through, but I'm just kind of going to going to summarize the things we looked at as we looked at um, Exodus and Numbers specifically after leaving Egypt, um, we saw that Moses, you know, not only got the commandments, the Torah, but he also comes down with, with engineering blueprints, instructions um, to set up and build, not to just the nation, but the tabernacle. Exodus, we saw the structure um, we saw the furniture. We saw the priesthood. Um, Leviticus, we looked at. Then we saw, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the offerings and everything they represent, um, all pointing to Messiah. Um, we looked at the makeup of the building of the, of the tabernacle. Excuse me, one second. As we looked at the brass, um, we saw that it represents uh, the fiery judgment. As we looked at the gold, we saw that it represented deity. And, you know, last but not least, we saw the silver representing the blood as we, as we looked at the redemption shekel um, for redeeming. Um, we looked at the 30 pieces of betrayal that we see in the brick where Judas receives the 30 pieces um, to betray Yahushua. We see in that same silver, we see that the tabernacle posts, um, as we looked at the building and the different aspects of the structure, we see that this, the, the posts sit in silver sockets. So the whole tabernacle structure rests in silver sockets inside the ground. And that representing Yahushua, just as we rest, not only in the Sabbath, we rest in his blood that gives us deliverance, which washes away all of our sins. So, I thought that those things were important to look at, you know, as we try to understand um, the, the, the duties of the Levites, because last week, last two weeks, we looked at the armies 
right? And we looked at understanding that each tribes, each of the tribes set up in threes, Judah, Reuben, Dan, um, uh, they, they were all set up in threes, each representing a different tribe, but each having camps, right? Ephraim being the final one, set up on the north, south, east, and west. Um, and we saw the movement of them in the camps, but we also had the Levites, which were in the center, <coughs> which were responsible for the tabernacle. So now we're gonna start looking at some of those things um, as Aaron and his sons are brought forth um, and we start seeing the service of the Levi. So let's get into chapter three. Um, I'll actually start off reading. Um, well, actually, uh, who would like to start off reading? I, I don't want to jump in. Does anyone want to read the first? Um, <clears throat> Let's just look at the first four verses because I want to discuss Aaron and his sons. The first four verses. Go ahead, four, brother. I'll we'll go from there. I'm sorry, Rick. What'd you say? I said go ahead. Go ahead and read the first four if you want. Oh yeah, I can. I was asking to see if anyone wanted to read. I was like volunteering. <laughs> All right, no one wants to read. I will uh, pick up in chapter three, uh, verse one. It says, Now these are the records of Aaron and Moses when Yahuwah spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai. And these are the names of the sons of Aaron, Nadab, the firstborn, and Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. These are the names of the sons of Aaron, the anointed priest whom he consecrated to minister as priest. Nadab and Abihu had died before Yahuwah when they offered profane fire before Yahuwah in the wilderness of Sinai, and they had no children. So Eleazar and Ithamar ministered as priests in the presence of Aaron, their father. So what do we see? Um, I'd like to hear what you guys see in those first four verses before I expound on them a little bit more. For me, the thing that I see this picks out is the uh, the final verse here when we see that they had these two died before Yahuwah when they offered either strange fire or profane fire uh, before Yahuwah you know that's that's something that's kind of perplexing when you think about you know what is that really meaning what is that what is that word what does that mean in that sentence you know why did they be what is the strange fire I guess you know and you know basically um, my thoughts on, on this are basically that it's referring to the, uh, uh, let me go back here, that it's referring to their, you know, their, their teaching, you know, because these were priests, you know, these were, these guys were the ones that were, were bringing forth the word uh, to the people. They were the ones bringing forth the prayers, doing the sacrifices and those type of things. And so you have to understand what is what is this what is this strange fire that it's talking about or or this profane fire, you know? I, I was looking back at it in here. Um, let me go back here to where I was at here, because uh, I was looking at these words here to see what they what they really represented, and you know, they were offering, you know, that they here it says that they came near, or they approached, is that word. Um, Arab, which means that they that they that they offered up a fire or a, that was profane or a, or a, a strange fire before Yahuwah, you know, and you have to wonder what is that representing or what is that meaning when it's talking about that strange fire, you know. There's there's a, there's different kind of views on this, you know. It has to do with 
you know, the burnt offerings, you know, and, and the offerings itself and how they went through them and did them. There was something that was perverse there that caused them to die before Yahuwah because they did something that was out of order, you know, and I think that that's what we want to, that's what I wanted to kind of focus uh, our attention on at this point, because to me, I don't have a full understanding of what that's referring to there. So clearly. Right. Cool. Cool. So if you remember in Leviticus, we covered this. Um, chapter nine, I'll pick up in uh, verse 23 of Leviticus chapter nine. And it says this, Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle of meeting and came out and blessed the people. Then the glory of Yahuwah appeared to all the people and fire came out from before Yahuwah and consumed the burnt offering and the fat on the altar. When all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. So we see um, a picture of what Yahuwah um, uh, instructs. We see a picture of what Yahuwah does in reference to fire, in reference to his holy um, representations, Aaron and his sons, for them to understand and to follow. He consumed it, he off he, the offering and burns it and consumes it all. When the people saw it, they were blessed, right? Look at what happens right after that. Verse 10, um, chapter 10, verse one. Then Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it, put incense on it and offered profane fire. Right. And then it says, <clears throat> put um, an offer profane fire before Yahuwah, which he had not commanded them. So they take it upon themselves to try to emulate what they were watching to do something that Yahuwah did not command. So it was disobedience. Verse two. So fire went out from Yahuwah and devoured them. And they died before Yahuwah and Moses and Aaron. Uh, and Moses said to Aaron, this is what Yahuwah spoke saying, by those who come near me, I must be guarded as holy and before all people, I must be glorified. So something in what they did um, in reference to this profane fire, whether it was perversion, whether it was an emulation of something they saw from the surrounding nations was a direct disobedience to Yah. The Levites, specifically Moses' son, uh, Aaron's sons, are Yahuwah's representatives to the people. They had to be holy. They had to be righteous. They had to be blameless. And here, Yahuwah has to make an example of them before all the people. Their disobedience is not accepted in any way or form. So we see clearly sin has a recompense. Sin has a consequence. Um, so uh, many different speculations about what they actually did, but whatever they did was not in, was not prescribed by what Yahuwah gave in his instructions for the Levites to do. So brother uh, Devlon or sister Wendy, Hey, um, yeah, I um picking up on what you were saying, uh, Brother Rob. Um, well, I, I'm in agreement. Um, the wording in the Tree of Life version is a little different. I personally don't really like this version, but either way, you know, it says that they offered unauthorized fire. Um, but so I feel like out of all of the translations that I have to go around that one word right there is pretty accurate in my opinion yeah. um they did something extra or different of their own accord mm -hmm. um and we see that a lot in modern days as well um people taking it upon themselves to do extra or do things their own way um 
and we have to be careful. An example of that is um, I don't remember what it was exactly, but there was a um part of a Facebook group for following Torah, and someone asked a question about yeah, well, all right. I don't remember what it was about, but it was a particular law that is unclear to us because it pertained to something we can't do anymore because we're not in the land anymore. But one of the most popular comments was, hey, since things are unclear with us now in the modern day, we can see this as a, um, yeah, it's given us an opportunity to turn it into some way to use our creativity to do our own thing. Now, I did not comment because I, I don't speak on things that I didn't have, don't have a lot of knowledge on. Um, right. So I could not answer the question. But even though I did not know the answer, I, I feel like using or trying to look for an opportunity to use your own creativity for something as serious like Yah's commands is just foolish. But it's extremely common. It's extremely common. And it feeds a lot of itching ears. Um, so, and I know some people don't take this particular event very seriously because they'll say, oh, it was long ago. And, um, you know, he doesn't blow people up with fire anymore or something like that. But these are his feelings. He takes this stuff very seriously. So, well, yeah, that's what I've got to say about it. Yeah, no, nah, brother, that is, that is <clears throat> accurate. Um, very good assessment of the foolishness that comes out of people's mouths when they don't know something. You know, one of the things we do here, and you'll get to know this, um, we, don't, we don't claim to know everything. We, to the best of our abilities, lock down study, look at words, look at the, the, the present day, look at the time, look at the letter, look at the, the, the book, you know, try to understand the, the culture. Uh, <clears throat> and, we, and we try to study together to make sure we come up with the right answer now. There are times where we we are not, and we say that. Like if, if we say, man, I don't know what that means. You know, what does that mean? Rick just did it. He said, I don't know what that means. And then we went into looking at kind of the understanding and, and co um, collectively, you and I, brother, both explained, you know, that it was something that was not instructed by Yah that they did, right? So... Um, to come up with a with an idea out of the air to say something like Yah gives you opportunity in this spot in re in reference to his commands to his instructions to be creative with them is absolute it's ludicrous you know so great catch and you know uh, sometimes you don't have to answer foolishness um, because you may have ended up getting into an argument for nothing you know what I mean so. Great observation there, um, but you know we definitely have to be mindful of things like that, and to be diligent, you know, in our study, um, to understand everything that Yah has for us, even those difficult things. Um, but we're still learning together. There are a lot of things that, that sometimes puzzle us, but there's an answer for everything in Scripture. We just have to continue looking. He doesn't leave us without understanding leave that crazy thank you brother um jp yeah hallelujah um i think we did talk about this a little bit in ex when we were going through exodus but you know they try to they try to come to yahuwah how they wanted to you know and and kind of what the brother was speaking on right now um, they try to come to yahuwah as how they want it and and we see that today even in our modern society people want to come to yahuwah how they want and, and he's supposed to accept them however they come like now that's what these two sons of Aaron they thought they you know us to me in my in my opinion it's like they thought they could do it how they you know want it and and Yahuwah proved them wrong and said no and um in Malachi 3 6 and in Malachi we know it's a little bit further along in, in history from Exodus and Numbers but it says in Malachi 3, 6, for I am Yahuwah, I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. And then verse 7 says, even from the days of your fathers, you are gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. So then what he says is, return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith Yahuwah of hosts. But you said, wherein shall we return? And in the context, you can continue to read. But it's like, he's like, 
just come back, come back to what I've already showed you from the beginning. You know, your fathers have strayed away. And this is in Malachi. So we see throughout history, there has always been a, a time where Yahuwah is continuing to say, come back, you know, and even through the New Testament, come back, you know, to, to your first love. Like this is, he loves us so much. And it, it's just amazing that he, he shows us in the scriptures, but he also shows us examples of what happens. Hallelujah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I like that. Um, <clears throat> and literally repent. Repent means return to Torah. <laughs> That's what John is telling us. You know, we're going to the gospel. Return to Torah. The kingdom is at hand. Return to the straight and right way. Live by the way. This is the instruction Torah that I gave you. Return back to that. That's what he's telling us. So um, we have to be mindful of what these words mean, what these terms mean. But JP, Brother Devlon uh, brought out creativity, which gives me an opportunity to uh, to ask you about one of your favorite passages in Acts when a husband and wife tried to get creative. Uh, t tell tell brother, show brother Devlon what happened when a husband and wife tried to get creative with Yah and the Ruach. <laughs> Well, you know, and, and this is a, a great portion because, you know, we deal with people, our brothers and sisters, I call them too, even, you know, today that will say, well, he's, he's not like that. We're under grace now. Hmm. And I've always like, I said, wait, wait hold on. Yahusha ascended. And then we get in the book of Acts chapter five. This is Mashiach sitting on the right hand of the father. So. <laughs> Of course, we, we've had grace since the beginning. Noah had grace. You know, Abraham had grace. It's not something changed. But we see what happens in chapter 5. Um, they were supposed to come back. As, and what they, it says in chapter 5 of the book of Acts, verse 2, and, and they kept back part of the price. His wife also being privy to it, she understood. She knew that what was going on and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. So she comes with what she thinks I'm going to give him knowing the fact that what they were told to do, she knew it's not something hidden. And Peter said in verse three, Ananias, why had Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Ruach HaKodesh and to keep back part of the price of the land? And he says to them, while it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in your heart? Thou hast not lied unto me, but unto Elohim. And then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the Ruach, and great fear came on all them that heard these things. So at this moment, that person was dealt with by Yahuwah, um, and that's this is in the book of Acts, chapter 5. And of course, we can continue to read on that story, but it's an, it's, it's an amazing account. Again, another witness to show us that's not... Um, Let's not, you know, I think what happens is people, they like the brother was speaking on, like we're in a different time. Like, you know, it's like, and that's what people have failed, I think, to see that we're not in a different time because with Yahuwah, there's no time and space. It's it's all one time, with, you know, so he changes not, you know, praise Yahuwah, hallelujah. Praise Yah and, and Brother Devlon, in both those cases, something beautiful happened. They tried to get creative. Nehab and Abihu, um, uh, Ananias and Sapphira, tried to emulate something holy by doing something unholy, using their creative mind, what people are saying that we should do, which we should not. And we see in both cases, the exact same thing happened. So great, great um, insight to bring out that whole idea of creativity um, in your experience with, uh, you know, uh, something you were listening to and the two passages, the one we're reading now and what Brother JP just shared out of Acts chapter five. So praise God. Um, Sister Marlo, watch along. Sister Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Um, I was thinking of that he says that he was he and he changes not and JP just took that. So <laughs> he pretty much said it. He doesn't change. But what I was getting from the whole thing was 
in a spiritual sense. They took something, they wanted him to be different. He gave the word, they knew what, I mean, actually, I'm going to take that back because I don't think that they actually knew. But I'm looking at it in a sense, as in when we go to prayer with him, and we're looking to him for something. And a lot of times people are going, they want him to be different than what he is. He's already planned this. He's already put it in order and they want it to be different. So they're asking without changing themselves because though he doesn't change, we are the ones who do need to change to fit what he has for us. And, but no one, but it's not, I'm not gonna say no one. People, some people are just not changing. They're going and saying, hey, Father, you know this, take me through this. But that's how I see it. I see it as he's saying, wait, why are you giving me this strange stuff? Why are you saying hallelujah? You're thinking about hallelujah for something bad, you know, or why are you not focusing on the right thing? And that's what I got from that. He is and he, does, he doesn't change. Right. Well, <clears throat> Um, I mean, you can you can you can relate that to prayer in in this way. You know, he 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 tells us to you know whatever we ask in his name, he'll give us, he'll grant us, right? But the idea, like you said, is to change so that what we're asking for isn't what we want. What we're asking for is his will, because now we see things the way he sees things, and when we see things the way he sees things. What we desire, what we ask for is going to be something that he already wants to give us. It's waiting for us. We just have to ask for it. So instead of, you know, cars and houses, not that we can't ask for those things in form of need. But I think in, in, in the way you're looking at it in reference to prayer, it has to be asking his will, which is his, is his, his desire for us to tie into as we start to look like him and talk like Amen. him. And walk like Amen. Amen. That's God. exactly what I was saying. Thank you. Yeah. Brother Rick. Yeah, what I'm seeing here in this regard is that he's, uh, in these two different accounts, if we examine them both, we're looking at, they both disobeyed, you know, the, 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 the either the, the structure or, uh, I don't know what the, what category that would be. The statures, you know, there's different categories that that he outlines for us, you know. And in this sense, you know, we see that they're doing things that are out of order that were directed by Yahuwah to do a certain way. And we and if we do things that are outside of that certain way or directive that Yahuwah has established in His Word, you know, these people here were priests. You know, they had a certain order. They had certain uh, uh, obligations and things that they had to do in a certain order, in a certain way that was outlined by Yahuwah, and he gave that directive to Moshe. And, you know, so we see that these things that were are, are being orchestrated here in a strange way, and I see him is that they're doing things that are outside. They're, they're trying to add to this. They're trying to do it in a unique, creative way that Yahuwah doesn't prescribe, and it, and it doesn't gain the results that he's, that he's requiring there. You know, in, in fact, it can actually pollute or, you know, uh, defile, you know, what you who with that purpose for you who has instructed this to do. And in the same regard with the other in, in acts, you know, th that was quite simple. They did that on their own regard and they lied. Basically, they're being deceitful out the weight, and the measures and all those things that come in in regard to this. But you know what? They weren't told that they had to do this. They did it on their own and they lied about it. And there was a certain thing there that, you know, when you're making this obligation or this vow, you know, you who what does you who tell us about making vows, you know, that you can't keep or that you don't keep. And now you go and and especially when it's in regards to something like this, you know, you can almost see, you know, why there's such punishment for this stuff, you know. Maybe he don't zap us right with fire and kill us right away, but you don't know, you know, how he will handle that. You know, so it's, I think it's, it's, it's for us to, to see that we have to walk in a certain order. That's what that, you know, returning back to the ancient path is that, that, that way that's outlined for us that, that we're trying to return back to, you know, and we're trying to get an understanding of what is our responsibilities 
you know, so that we're in alignment with that so that we don't get punished too, you know, because we're trying to be creative and unique in this world, you know, so that like, uh, like the brother said, you know, it's just the ears of the people, you know, we don't want to be that, that kind of a, an assembly. We don't want to itch your ears. You know, we want to fill your soul and, and, and have you changed, you know, into the likeness and the image of the Alaheen. That's our goal here. So praise you. Praise you. Praise you. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> absolutely. All right. So let's, um, let's continue. Um, picking up in, uh, verse five, I want to talk about something else too, in regards to what we already read, but because the distinction is being made, I'll come back and talk about it since this, this portion is also part of what I want to discuss, but Verse five says, and Yahuwah spoke to Moses saying, bring the tribe of Levi near and present them before Aaron, the priest, that they may serve him and they shall attend to his needs and the needs of the whole congregation before the tabernacle of meeting and do the work of the tabernacle. Also, they shall attend to all the furnishings of the tabernacle of meeting and to the needs of the children of Israel and to do the work of the tabernacle. And you shall give the Levites to Aaron and his sons. They are given entirely to him from among the children of Israel. So you shall appoint Aaron and his sons and they shall attend to their priesthood. But the outsider who comes near shall be put to death. Then Yahuwah spoke to Moses saying, now behold, I myself have taken the Levites from among the children of Israel instead of every firstborn who opens the womb among the children of Israel. Therefore, the Levites shall be mine because all the firstborn are mine. On the day I stuck all the firstborn, or excuse me, struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, I sanctified to myself all the firstborn in Israel, both man and beast, they shall be mine. I am Yahuwah. So what, what stands out to us here in this, in this section? My goodness. You see all of the left tops in here? Say again. Do you see all of the left tops in here? <laughs> this is like a feast. Uh, we, we, you know, I'm seeing here that it's, it's, now, again, let's bring this back to what is these Aleph Tavs? This is a covenant agreement, something that Yahuwah has claimed, uh, something that's set apart unto Yahuwah. So now when we look at this, the, all that you have read in the Aleph Tavs that are in here, we start to see the, 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 uh, the, the I guess the, the nearness or the, uh, the hand of Yahuwah on each one of these aspects that he's outlining here. And I don't want to reread it again, but it's almost like I have to in some of these spots, if you don't mind, but just to, so we can see where these left tops land. And where it says, I'm just going to start in, in, in the, in the third verse here, where it says, bring a left top, the tribe of Levi near me. So he's already put that covenant symbol on, on Levi where he says later that they're mine. Right. So it's uh, when we see this, that, that, that he's bringing uh, this, this tribe near him to present uh, them before Aaron, the priest, that they may minister unto him. So he's chosen them to, to do a certain task here. And, it, and it's not only unto, uh, unto Aaron, but unto all of the tribe of Yisrael. So we see, and then he says, and then they shall guard a left top, his watch, and a left top, the watch of the whole assembly before the tabernacle assembly to do a left tav, the service of the tabernacle. So you see, there's so many aspects that he's talking about what their, what their jobs are entitling, what their responsibilities are to the tabernacle that, that is so dear and it represents him. And, and they shall guard a left tav, all the instruments of the tabernacle and of the assembly and a left tav of the uh, charge of the children of Yasserel. So he's giving them charge over Yasserel you know, the, as the priest, you know, that's going to minister and that's also going to uh, keep the people of Yisrael on track, 
uh, with the with the sacrifices and those things which are required here, and to do a left out the services of the tabernacle. So we see. I'm not going to continue on here, but as we look at this and as we continue to see the depth of what is, what he has established here with these people and their responsibilities, we can see the intertwining, if you will, uh, of of this covenant relationship that he has with his people and his priests. Elia? You're muted, brother. All right. Can you hear me now? All right. Yeah. No, great job, brother. Um, so <clears throat> what I wanted to talk about, and, 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 and absolutely, brother, you, you, you're pointing to some things um, that are distinctive, right? So we have the first four verses, which talks about Aaron and his sons. They are, they are the priests, Right. And then it says, and Yahuwah spoke to Moses saying, bring all of the of the tribe of Levi near and present them before Aaron, the priest. So we see um, Aaron and his sons are the priests. All the priests are also Levites. But all the all the uh, all the Levites weren't priests. So what we have in the first four verses in the verses we just read from five to 13, we see a distinction between the service of the Levites, of the Levites and the distinction between them and the priests. Um, so um, all the Levites weren't priests, but they all had, had on Levi jeans. You guys will get that in a minute. <laughs> um, just a funny joke. So. Uh, one of the things I wanted to look at is it says, and Yahuwah spoke to, 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 to Moses saying, bring the tribe of Levi near. So why, why the tribe of Levi? Why not Gad? You know, why not, you know, Simeon? Why not, you know, Reuben, you know? Um, but if we look back in Exodus, because remember, this is, this is one story this is this isn't chapter bricks here um we have this for the benefit of finding out where things are um, for study and for understanding exodus chapter 32 um and i'll start in verse 25 it says now when moshe moses saw the people were unrestrained for Aaron had not restrained them to their shame among their enemies. Then Moses stood in the entrance of the camp and said, whoever is on Yahuwah's side, come to me. And the sons of Levi gathered themselves together to him. And he said to them, thus saith Yahuwah Elohim of Israel, let every man put his sword on his side and go in and out from entrance to entrance throughout the camp and let every man kill his brother, every man his companion, every man his neighbor. So the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses and about 3000 men of the people fell that day. Then Moses, um, I'll stop there. So we see this set apart group, this set apart tribe um, that was close to Yahuwah and Yahuwah rewarded them to be his priests, to be his chosen people. Um, so he set them aside as priests, Aaron and his sons, and then the rest of the Leviticals, Levitical tri uh, pre uh, priesthood was also broken down to the service. So these are all the Levites that weren't sons of Aaron. Um, and they had duties, and we're going to get into some of what those duties were. Um, so I just wanted to bring that out. Um, there's several more things that are in this chapter, but I wanted to see if anyone wanted to add anything else before before I uh, expound a little bit more. Go ahead, Brother Rick. That name Levi, what it means is uh, to accompany, to escort, to walk together. So you can almost see the reason that, uh, that he chose them for this purpose, just in the name. You know, I just found that interesting. But the the name 
has to fit the character of of the people. And I think that's what is important about the names of the heads of the tribes, their character fit their name. And that's why they were honorable before Yahuwah. Um, and what does he call us? He calls us a royal priesthood. So what are we supposed to do? What is our character supposed to look like, right? Same goes for us. This is not just talking about the Levites in the book of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. It's talking about us now. Praise God. What else do we see? <clears throat> Anybody? Okay. All right. So verse 10 kind of stands out to me. It says, um, so you shall appoint Aaron and his sons, and they shall attend to their priesthood. Um, so when I looked at that, it reminded huh? Finish, finish the rest of that, because that was where I was focused at. I thought you were going to head there at the end of that verse. Oh, yeah. No, we, you, can, you can look at it when I'm done. I just wanted to talk about that portion. Okay, go ahead. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, when I, when I saw that, it reminded me of a passage in Hebrews, um, Hebrews chapter five. Let me pull it up. Hebrews chapter five, starting in verse one, it says, for every high priest taken from among men is appointed from for men in things pertaining, pertaining, pertaining to Elohim, that he might offer both gifts and sacrifices for sin. Here's the important part. He can have compassion on those who are ignorant and going astray, since he himself is also subject to weakness. So when I look at that, I see that even though he chose this, this tribe, this family, that there was grace, you know, bestowed upon them because look at what, you know, JP was talking about, you know, grace is in the, you know, people say grace is in the New Testament, you know, but grace is, grace and grace and mercy were given at the same time, um, you know, to Moshe because we see that even in selecting he can have compassion for those who are ignorant and are going astray since he himself also subject to weakness. Verse three, because of this, he is required as for the people, so also for himself to so offer sacrifices for sins. And no man can take his honor to himself, but he who was called by Elohim, just as Aaron was. Aaron <laughs> was the leader of the, of the dudes that were putting together the golden calf. They were acting a fool, you know, when Moshe was in Mount Sinai, when he was supposed to be taken care of, but yet Yahuwah gives him grace and allowing still his family to be the priests. So we see the grace bestowed, not just because of what they did, but also the grace he gave them for what he should have done to all of them for what they did. So. That kind of stood out to me and I wanted to kind of look at that and, and see in reference to what Yahuwah has done and will consistently do as we keep in our minds that he doesn't change. Um, so brother Rick, you wanted to look at uh, the second part of verse 10, which says, but the outsider who comes near shall be put to death. What did you want to say on that? Does that could that have something to do with uh, these other two, which they were different, but in the same example, those that because he's referring to to the uh, the priest, right, uh, the priesthood, right? He's he's making a distinction between the priesthood, Aaron and his sons, and the rest of the Levites. They right. they weren't able to do the the work of the priesthood. They had their own duties. They could not cross the path of doing. They couldn't be inside the tabernacle to do the duties of the priests. 
they had their own duties, which he's about to go yeah. into, and so that so that they know what they're supposed to do and what they're not. Anyone outside the family of Aaron and his sons were not priests, so they could not do the duties of the priesthood. Exactly. Well, you covered that pretty good. That was uh, what I was going to cover there. But uh, as we continue to look at that just a little bit further on, and we see that, um, and, and I just think that this is the distinction that you just mentioned here about, he said he that I have taken a left top, the Levite from among the children of Yasserel, instead of all of the firstborn that opened the womb of the children of Yasserel. So he's making a distinction there. Um, you know, that, you know, usually the, the, the firstborn are dedicated unto him, you know, uh, but here he's making a distinction between, no, that's not the ones that I'm calling to be my priest, even though those are, un, are, are dedicated unto me as well. But these are a particular that I have chosen from among Yeshurel, uh from the tribe, you know, of Aaron and his sons. And, and therefore that, that was kind of what stuck out to me there. Yeah, he's actually saying two things there. So the first part, which we just covered, he's talking about distinction between the priests and the rest of the Levites. What you just brought up, he's actually substituting the firstborn. Remember the law of the firstborn, which we covered in Exodus, which we're going to look. We're going to look at that too. We'll, we'll look at that passage so we can understand it. But the law of the firstborn. Remember the law of the firstborn was the grace he gave to those that had the Passover, that he passed over, those you belong to me and you pay a redemption price. Remember we talked about the silver. Well, the firstborn were also taken from those who didn't have the Passover, which were all the Egyptians. So he's bringing reference to what he saved them, how he delivered them. So he required a redemption for all the firstborn, but now he's saying, the Levites will replace the firstborn. You no longer have to give your firstborn. I'm taking the Levites as my firstborn. And he's going to he's going to expound on that later as we get into the chapter. So he's actually saying two separate things there. Praise God. JP. Oh, yeah, I was I was just kind of looking in that same place of, uh, of the firstborn. If was I, I was just thinking of the the heir, you know, the firstborn, he, he gains the inheritance. And I don't know if that correlated with this or not, or if that's just separate from this, um, kind of similar to what, you know, Jacob and Esau, you know, they dealt with, you know, and oh. all of the firstborns, you know, they would get the, the inheritance the firstborn would. Right. Um, and he makes a distinction here that the Levites are his firstborn. Um, it says, instead of all the children of Israel, um, so, yeah. so I was just thinking about that. I don't know if that had anything to do with it or if that's like a separate kind of. Kind of right. No, something. that's separate. So the, 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 this, this is pertaining to the law of the firstborn, which I'm, a, I'm actually going to read that in a few. I have it. Um, yeah, I'm a, it, because it comes up again in, 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 in verse 40 to 51. So I'm going to read pertaining to the law of the first one, which this is pertaining to. But what you're pertaining to, what you're talking about, um, we read earlier um, in verse two, it says, and these are the names of Aaron, of the sons of Aaron, Nahab, the firstborn, and Abihu, um, because they lost their inheritance. They were supposed to be the ones that were watching over everything. And it ended up being Eleazar and Ithamar because of their disobedience. So that would pertain to the inheritance that they were to receive, um, but not this part. This is talking about the law of the firstborn that Yahuwah required after they were delivered from Egypt. Um, and that passage is in Exodus 13, but we're, we're going to read it out later. Cool. All right. Hallelujah. Praise God, praise God. So, um, so we see um, clearly that this is talking about service. And now we're going to go into understanding what all of this means in regards to the distinction we're talking about, the Levites 
being separated or distinctively looked at outside of the priests. Remember the priests are Levites, but all Levites weren't priests. So we're gonna go into the numbering of the Levites and what their duties were, what the services were, um, what the three sons, um, the Gershonites, the Kohathites, and the Marianites, being all the Levites and what their specific duties were. So this portion is uh is 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 really important. We're gonna we're gonna pull out a few things here that you guys are gonna be reminded of and appreciate from the Brit because the Brit is explaining what we're seeing here. So we get full understanding um, and we're not left in the cold to understand what these things mean. So uh, we can start reading, I'll, I'll start and then we'll just break it down as we go through. Um, Cause there's a lot with what's being said here um, but a lot could be missed as well. Um, verse 14, says this, it says, then Yahuwah spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai saying, number the children of Levi for their father, uh, by their father's houses, by their families, you shall number every male from a month old and above. So we now see the structure in which he's numbering them from a month, month old and above. So from one month old, so as far as their, their age is, you'll number them. Now, remember we were numbering the armies before, now we're, we're numbering the Levites in accordance to the service that they are to provide for the priesthood, right? Um, verse 16 um, says this, so Moses numbered them according to the word of Yahuwah as he commanded, as he was commanded rather. These were the sons of Levi by their names, Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. Um, and these are the names of the sons of Gershon by their families, Lebni and Shemin, and the sons of Kohath by their family names, Amram, Amram was Moses and Aaron's father, Ish, Is Izahar, Hebron, and Uziel, and the sons of Merari by their families, Malhi or Mali and Mushi. <laughs> Mali and Mushi were the names of Merari, Merari's sons. These are the families of the Levites by the father's houses, by their father's houses. So now he's going to break down everything and the everything that they are to do. So we have the three sons, um, the three sons of, of Levi by their father's name. So each one, Gershonites, the Kohathites, and the Merarianites, or Marianites, all have a service, all have a duty, all have something they are supposed to do only. They're not supposed to cross over like we looked at before to do the work of the priest. They have specific duties that they are supposed to be doing. Um, verse 21, from Gershon came the family of the, the, the Libanites and the family of the Shemites. These were the families of the Gershonites. Those who were numbered according to the number of all the males from a month old and above. Of those who were numbered, there were 7,500. So the Gershonites were 7,500, verse 22. Verse 23, the families of the Gershonites were to camp behind the tabernacle westward. So we now see the numbering of the Gershonites. We now see the positioning. So they were supposed to be behind the tabernacle on the west side. Verse 24, and the leader of the father's house of the Gershonites was Eliasaph, the son of Leo. And the, du the duties of the children, here it, here it goes, the duties of the children of Gershon in the tabernacle of meeting included the tabernacle, the tent 
with its covering, the screen from the door of the tabernacle of meeting, the screen for the door of the court, the hangings of the court, which were around the tabernacle and the altar, and around the tabernacle and the altar and their cords, according to all the work relating to them. Um, and in chapter seven, we're going to see as we continue to read that they, because these these cloths, you know, were so heavy, they got wagons to carry them. So when we're looking at this, we see clearly that there was um, distinctive duties that just the Gershonites were supposed to do. They were in charge of all the garments, all the cloth, cloth, all the skins um, um, pertaining to the tabernacle. That was what they were supposed to do. Not only were they in charge of putting it up, they were also in charge of taking it down. So they had to serve their purpose, right? So we have to be mindful of a purpose that needs to be served by each person in the family, each person in the tribe. Each tribe has a duty. So the Gershonites were to work with the cloth, the, clo the, the cloths, right? Verse 27. Now, this is Kohath. Kohath came, from Kohath came the family of the Amorites, the family of the Isherites, Isherites, the family of the Hebronites, and the family of the Uzealites. And these were the families of the Kohalites. According to the number of the males from a month old and above, right, we discussed that, there were 8,600 keeping charge of the sanctuary. So the Kohath now are going to get their duties and their, 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 their uh, service. The families of the children of Kohath were, were to camp on the south side of the tabernacle. Now we see their position. And the leader of the fathers of the house of the families of the Kohathites was Elizaph, Elizaphan, the son of Uzziel. Their duty included the ark, the table, the lampstand, the altars, the utensils of the sanctuary in which they ministered the screen and all the work relating to them. And Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, was to be chief over the leader of the Levites with oversight of those who kept charge of the sanctuary. So we see a couple things here. We see that the Kohathites had a distinct, distinctly different uh, 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 job um, from the Gershonites. But we also see that because they were handling the ark, the table, the lampstand, the altars, the utensils in the sanctuary, there was a there was a priest, Eleazar, son of Aaron, that was to oversee all of the things that they were doing because they were in charge of the holy thing. So they had specific duties, but they had someone over them that was a priest because they were dealing with with the artifacts, the, the objects of the tabernacle, and it had to be overseen by the priests. Um, pick up in verse 33, and from Merari came the family of the Mahalites and the family of the Mushites. These were the families of Merari. And those who were numbered according to the number of all the males from one month old and above were 6,200. So 6,200 of this family, of this tribe, the leader of the father's house of the families of Merari was Zoreel, the son of Abihel. These were, these were to camp on the north side of the tabernacle. So now we see their position. And the appointed duty of the children, here it is, of Marii included the boards, the tabernacle, its bars, its pillars, its sockets, its utensils, all the work relating to them. 
and the pillars of the court all around their sockets, their pegs, and their cords, pegs, cotter pins, stuff like that. So they were in charge of all the, the framework, the building itself. Um, so we see all of these things and we realize and, and notice that not only is there order, not only is there structure, but there are specific things that every person is supposed to do. Every tribe is supposed to do. And they're not to mix and do things of the other people. Right? What does that this remind you of? Let's see a commentary on this. Let's look at um, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I mean, we can really read this whole chapter, but listen, listen, listen. It's, it's saying exactly what we're reading. They're not to cross over and do the things of the other. Uh, tribe, they are to do only what their specific duties were. Now concerning spiritual gifts, verse 1 of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles carried away to these dumb idols, however you were led. So in reference to understanding what Paul is saying to them, there was a specific way in the worship of idols and other deities corresponded in reference to the way they worshiped. And it was frivolous. It was um, un, un, unbridled. It was wicked. It was um, uh, perversive. And he's saying, don't bring that into here and try to make that what these gifts are. There's a distinction here. Same thing he told the Hebrews. Don't do what the other nations are doing you do it this way, follow my specific instructions. Therefore, verse three, I will make known to you that none, no one speaking by the spirit of Elohim calls Yahushua accursed. And no one can say that Yahushua is master except by the Ruach. Bogadesh, verse four, there are diversities of gifts, but the same Ruach. In other words, we can have the same gift, but there is a diversity, there is a difference. That's what diversity means. There is a difference between my gift and JP's gift. JP's gift and brother Sh and Shay G's gift. Uh, Rick's gift from Paul's gift. You know, so we all have different gifts. Even if we have the same gift, it's different, right? Listen to what it's saying. Diversities. Verse five, there are differences of ministries, but the same master. <clears throat> there are diversities of activities, but the same Elohim who works all in all, but the manifestation of the Ruach is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Ruach, to another the word of knowledge, through the same Ruach, to another faith by the same Ruach, to another gifts of healings by the same Ruach, to another working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning spirits, to another kinds, different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues, but one of the same spirit, Ruach, works all these things distributing to each one individually, right? Let's look at, Verse 12, it says, for the body is one and has many members, but all members to that one body being many are one body. Also in Messiah, for by one Ruach, we were all baptized into one body, whether Yahudim or Greek, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one Ruach. For in fact, the body is not is, is not one member, but many. So in like manner, we see the formation of the gifts being representative of a body. We see the formation of the nation, of the tribes being representative of the whole nation. Every tribe had their specific duty. 
That's what they were supposed to do. Every body part has its specific duty. Every person has a specific gift that is distinctive from every other gift that we all have. And we have to be comfortable in what Yahuwah has given us, not to covet what somebody else covets. You know, my wife has, has beautiful hazel eyes, <laughs> you know, in her head, on her face. But if I wake up in the morning and see one of her eyes on the, on the, on the floor, it's not as beautiful it was in her head. It's outside of the body. So when we operate that way, when we do things outside of what Yahuwah tells us to do, what Yahuwah tells us to be, it's no longer beautiful. It's no longer holy, um, Ananias and Sapphira, uh, 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 Nahab, Nahab and Abihu. It's no longer what Yahuwah has subscribed to you. So we see those things mirror each other because they're talking about the same thing. So we have to be mindful of what scripture tells us when it's given us instruction and when it's given us um, uh, uh the way, rolling out the red carpet for life. So let's make sure that we pay attention to those things as we continue to read in the instruction and the order that the Father gives us in all of these things. Praise God. Um, Sister Ina, I know that's you, unless it's your husband. <laughs> no, it's me this time. He's here too. What's up, um, brother? Please. How are you? Adelson. Yeah. Can you hear him? <laughs> he said, are you he's talking to you? He said, How you doing? Oh, good, brother. Good. Good. Good to hear your voice. Go ahead, sis. Um, I just wanted to share out just quickly when you were going over this, it it really hit me, not just when you were reading this, but everything that you're saying hit me in such a way of really understanding how ministry works in, in the body of Yahushua now. Yeah. Because when you're studying out how to play in the ministry of the people and with the ministry and upkeep of the temple and all the different parts and how it's very discreet, what you said came so to life to me when I began to look at um, people who did different things um, just in life, I'm not even say they offered their gift to Yahuwah because when it's out of place, you know, sometimes we don't see it or we don't reverence it. But I met this brother who was, he really had a ministry of healing and exercise, similar to what um, Sister Britt Yah has on, on this line. And he just really taught me so much about respecting that. Do you, I mean, and, and it was like, I never really saw it before how these people can come to be ministers in this aspect because they, they really begin to teach you how to take care of your temple mm. um, for what we know of in first Corinthians six and 19 and 20. Now we are the temple of y'all, right? So we have to take care of our temple. And so this particular brother, um, he, he, he had a lion. I think he called himself the lion of um, Yahuda or something where I actually got the opportunity to go and I thought I was just going another place, but it was it was beautiful to like meet a brother, a Torah keeping brother who began to teach me and be, he, he really began to discipline me about, you know, being careful about what I'm doing, what I'm eating, why that's important. Because sometimes people tell you don't do this and don't do that, but you don't get the why behind it. I guess I'm just like a little kid. I need to know why. But <laughs> it was like, you know, this is why, you know, because if you want father to be able to dwell with you you have to take care of your temple like this is not optional like I really begin to get it like yeah I know I shouldn't eat too many cookies but he's like you this is why you shouldn't eat too many cookies you know like this can come to be said and I'm like why you know but <laughs> it was really beautiful to get that experience and and like you said hazel eyes are beautiful but when they're in her eyes when they're in their place mm -hmm. It just gets even more beautiful. And I've always had a respect for people doing different things, but it was just beautiful to see it. And then that revelation hit me of you have brothers and sisters in ministry in all kinds of areas that sometimes you miss because they're not behind the pulpit. I mean, that's not what this is. This is a full, complete 
body. Like we all have to grow up into completion and the fullness of Yahushua. And it takes everybody doing their part. And so I was so grateful to that brother, even though he was so hard on me. <laughs> like, no, no, no you got to share them cookies with the rest of the assessment. <laughs> <laughs> That way yeah, we all eating, eating cookies this week, you know, and you know what? You're going to be eating plenty of those leafy green vegetables, you know, like it was like really holding me accountable. And, you know, I'm doing the knee push ups. He's like, no, I want you to do what they call the man style. But really, these are for everybody. So I'm going to need you to get off your knees. <laughs> get you well, some yeah, upper yeah, body no, I, mean, I think the body, the body is a perfect um, example uh, another example scripture uses is symphony, you know, and playing your instrument, playing the right time, playing the right note. You know, David set aside one family to be the singers, you know, you know, and, you know, I used to be um, you know, one of the things a lot of you may not know is that I was a music major um, coming out of high school. And, you know, knowing that there were different studies on family bloodlines having a specific um, carryover with vocal cords. In other words, if, you, if someone in your family, your husband and wife can sing, then the child can probably sing, you know, and how David had a family uh, set aside to sing, you know, in the temple, you know, and <laughs> someone that couldn't sing, you know, you, you know, I guess everything sounds good to Yah, but everything don't sound good to us. So there's certain people that have certain gifts, you know, um, that are specifically for the edification. Some of the sisters, you know, um, I don't want to call it no names because then I might miss somebody and then you know, I get offended. So all of this, the men and women that can sing, you know, when you guys sing, you baruch us, you bless us. It is edifying. You know, if someone can't sing, it's not like we don't appreciate you know, that you're singing out and crying out to Yah, but it's not the same. You know, it clashes, it clings, you know, in your in your ear. It's difficult. But um, and I'm not telling people don't sing if you want to sing. I'm just saying as far as you know, who was setting up gift, <laughs> as far as setting up um, gifts and giving to them liberally and specifically picking certain people to do certain things. And we see that going on right here in distinction between the, Levit the Levites and the priesthood um, and distinctively from the rest of the nations because they had to play their part too. You know, we talked about how they were set up for war. You don't see the Levites grabbing, you know, tools to, for war. You know, they're grabbing tools for the tabernacle, right? And then you had the warriors that did their thing. So we see the warriors, we see the worship, the Levites, and now we're talking about the service. So these were the servants of the Levite, of the, of the, of the priests, and they did their specific things. Um, so it's very important that we see that and make sure that we understand that consistently, Yah has set up order and structure to be followed specifically and to the T. Go ahead, brother. Yeah, I was curious. You just said something that sparked some thought in my head. When when they're going in war, you know, you know the 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 priest didn't fight, but do we see an example that they were praying uh, and those type of things behind the scenes in conjunction? You know, like we see that <clears throat> when uh, when Moshe how they were holding his hands up. You know, I'm just sure. in mind, right? I'm just wondering if there's something into that same sense. With the with the Levites. Well, they were they were they were they were the Levites. Remember, Aaron and and Moses are brothers. Yeah. So Aaron and her were holding his arms up. They're praying. They're doing their part while battle is going on. When their hands went down, they started to lose. When his hands went up, they were winning. So absolutely, that's that's the num that's the main <laughs> you know example right there. So praise God for that. Um, but we see that the working of the body, like, you know, there's specific things that, you know, I, my wife doesn't always like me to use us as an example, but, you know, she has specific gifts like a uh, gift of administration. She's very organized. Um, you know, you, you guys can see by the work that she does, you know, with all the assembly needs. 
you know, and some things she'll bring to me and like, I'm, I'm like, I, you know, I don't really, you know, why do we have to, do, you know, and when she breaks it down, I'm saying, oh, that makes sense. Now I don't have to do this, you know, reducing the work, working smartly instead of harder, it, it, you know, working smarter instead of working harder, right? Um, and all of those things that organization brings, there's this in, there's an insight and a foresight that people with that gift have, you know, um, and it's very important, you know, that everyone in the body operates within the gifts that they've been given. And that those that don't have those gifts, don't try to squelch those ideas because you lose something in the body. If the, if the feet are trying to be hands, you can't walk down the street. You know what I mean? We have to always think of the body and its operation as the body of Yahuwah, as the body of Yahushua. You know what I mean? We have to make sure that we understand the proper functions. So praise y'all. We're getting a glimpse into, see, y'all didn't know that that's what this was talking about, did you? So Thought was just names. Nah, this is, this is, this is the real. We're going through the real, real. All right, let's finish this chapter out. Um, we left off in verse 38. It says, um, moreover, those who were, oh, thank you, Sister Ina, by the way. Um, great testimony. Moreover, those who were to camp before the tabernacle were on the east. Before the tabernacle of meeting were Moses, Aaron, and his son. So you see all of the families of the Levites had their positioning, southwest, east, and north. Moses and Aaron and his sons were in the east, keeping charge of the sanctuary to meet the needs of the children of Israel. But the outsider who came near was to be put to death. You couldn't do the duties of these men. <laughs> you had your own duties. And if you tried to cross over, you were put to death. All who were numbered of the Levites, whom Moshe and Aaron numbered at the commands of Yahuwah by their families, all the males from a month old and above were 22,000. <clears> so we see all the duties. The Gershonites were in charge of the clothing, the cloth, the skins, the uh, Kohorites. I'm sorry, the Kohathites were in charge of the objects, the ark the menorah, the table, a, a showbread, um, and the Marianites were in charge of the framework, the building itself, the structure, giving order and structure to all. And we saw the representation of that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 in the operation of the body in, this, in the um, giving of the gifts by Yah. So um, the final portion is what we were talking about earlier in the, the, the substitution of the Levites in lieu of the firstborn. Substitution. Who else substituted? Who else took on something that you were supposed to get but took it to themselves so that you could be free? You see where we're going here. You see what the Levitical priesthood and, and the Exodus, and now the numbering is referring to the volume of the book speaks of me, saith Yahushua. <laughs> you gotta see it, you gotta see it. Let's read through, let's finish it out. It says, verse 40, then Yahuwah said to Moses, number all the males, firstborn males of the children of Israel from a month old and above and take the numbering of their names. So, this is speaking of the whole house of Israel, not just the, 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 the Levites. This is speaking of the whole house of Israel because it's speaking of the firstborn that are supposed to be dedicated to Yah, right? By their names. And you shall take the Levites for me, I am Yahuwah, instead of all the firstborn among the children of Israel. So the Levites will replace the firstborn, basically and the livestock of the Levites instead of all the first among the livestock of the children of Israel. 
For Moses numbered all the firstborn among the children of Israel, and Yahuwah command as Yahuwah commanded him. And all the firstborn males, according to the number of the names, from a month old and above. For those who were numbered <clears throat> of them were 22,273. So of all the children of Israel, the number <clears throat> was 200, that was uh, 22,273, the firstborn males. Then Yahuwah spoke to Moses saying, take the Levites instead of all the firstborn among their children of Israel and the livestock of the Levites instead of their livestock, the Levites shall be mine. I am Yahuwah. And for the <coughs> redemption of the 273 of the firstborn of the children of Israel, um, who are more than the number of the Levites, you shall take five shekels for each one. So it's supposed to be life for life, Levites for the firstborn. But the le but the, the 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 children of Israel, firstborn, outnumbered the Levites by two hundred and seventy three. So then he gives orders what to do for the redemption of those two hundred and seventy three. He says you shall take five shekels for each one individually. You shall take them in the currency of the shekel of the sanctuary, a shekel of twenty geras. And you shall give the money with which the excess number of them is redeemed to Aaron and his son. So we see clearly that the distinction between the number of the Levites and the number of the children of Israel's firstborn was to go um, man for man, livestock for livestock. The children of Israel over went over over four, uh, 273. So they were given instruction on what to do for the rest of them. And the money they, 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 they collected for the redemption of those men, of those lives, went to Aaron and his sons. Verse 49, so Moses took the redemption money for those who were over and above those who were redeemed by the Levites. Verse 50, from the firstborn of the children of Israel, he took the money, 1,365 shekels, according to the shekel of the sanctuary. And Moses gave the redemption money to Aaron and his sons, according to the word of Yahuwah, as Yahuwah commanded Moses. Praise Yah. Um, Sister uh, Ina. Wow. There's so much there I don't want to come back to. I really want to talk about um, the redemption piece, but I wanted to give a, a second answer to um, Brother or Elder Rick when he asked about was, it, was there another example in scripture? In Second Chronicles chapter 20, there's another example in scripture of the Levites doing praise, prayer, even some prophesying um, prior to a battle and even during a battle. Um, it was the battle with Jehoshaphat and with the Amorites and Ammonites and the Moabites um, and the Meonites as well. When they came up against Jehoshaphat, you have another example of, of the priests going or moving in syncretism with the warriors to worship Yahuwah and to bring forth victory. Um, so if you look at the entire chapter, I would say that it would be good. Second Chronicles 20 verses one through 37. Since he asked there, if there was another example of that, I wanted to share that out. And then I had a question surrounding um, the price of redemption here. Mm -hmm. And um, I thought it was very interesting that it said that the excess had to be ransomed and that the ransom price was according to the shekel of the sanctuary. So there, there, there seems to be a differentiation here with the shekel of the sanctuary and the regular shekel. And I, I wanted to ask you about that. 
Yeah, so <clears throat> there was there was a, a redemption price um, for each each body, each person, um, and I wanted to go over that because I wanted to look at the law of the firstborn in Exodus chapter thirteen. So I'll read there, um, Exodus thirteen chapter um, verse eleven says, "And it shall be <clears throat> when Yahuwah brings you into the land of the Canaanites." Right, as he swore to you and your fathers and gives it to you, you shall set apart to Yahuwah all that opened the womb, that is every firstborn that comes from an animal, which you have, the males shall be Yahuwah's. For every firstborn of the donkey, you shall redeem with a lamb. And if you will not redeem it, you shall break its neck. And all the firstborn of man among your sons, you shall redeem. So it shall be when your son asks you in the time coming, what is this? What is this about? That you shall say to him, by strength of the hand of Yahuwah, brought us out of Egypt, <coughs> excuse me, out of the house of bondage. And it came to pass when Pharaoh was stubborn about letting us go, that Yahuwah killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of the beasts. Therefore, I sacrifice to Yahuwah all males that open the womb from the firstborn of my sons I redeem. It shall be as a sign on your hand and as frontlets between your eyes, who by the strength of the hand of Yahuwah brought us out of Egypt. So we see that there was a promise um, in remembrance of what Yahuwah had been doing or was doing um, and had done with the children of Israel in their exodus from Egypt. So when we get to um, the passage that we're looking at today, we see that there is a substitution for that claim that the firstborn um, <coughs> Have have a ransom in being given away to Yahuwah. Now, as far as the shekels, um, um, I'll read here. Um, So, so your question was pertaining to the difference between the shekels for the ransom and the shekels for for what? What was your question again? Hallelujah. I was just noticing that they said after the shekel of the sanctuary. So I was wondering if there was a difference between the shekel of the sanctuary and the regular shekel since they made that distinction. Oh, I have I have no idea. I have to I thought you were pertaining to I thought you were talking about the fact that there was a ransom. Um let's see. I believe what it's referring to there is at the end where it's talking about the the funds that were uh or the shekels that were the difference that these had to do with the sanctuary because of the uh the Levites were in charge of the sanctuary. I believe that's probably uh, why it's making that differentiation there, where it's talking about after the shekel of the sanctuary, because it uh, <clears throat> it seems as though that's what it's re uh, getting into here, where it's talking about, you know, because it's right after he talks about the difference uh, in the in the numbers between the, the children of Yisrael and the Levites, and the shekels that had to make the difference, which he accentuates here at the bottom with Moshe gave a left out of the money of them to uh, that were redeemed unto Aaron and to his sons, according to the word of Yahuwah, as Yahuwah commanded a left out of Moshe. So. Right. So, so now I, I get it now. So in the, in the, in the redeeming um, for the sanctuary, <clears throat> remember in Leviticus, we went over the price of the people. 
and what they were to be redeemed by. So Rick is right in, in, in reference to where the shekel was going. But remember in chapter 27, um, it, it says this of Leviticus. Now Yahuwah spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, when a man consecrates a vow, certain persons to Yahuwah according to the valuation. If your valuation is of a male from 20 years old to 60 years old, then the valuation shall be 50 shekels of silver, according to the shekel of the sanctuary. If it is a female, then your valuation shall be 30 shekels. And if your valuation is of from five years up to 20 years old, <clears throat> then your valuation for a male shall be 20 shekels and for a female, 10 shekels. And if from a month old to five years old, then your valuation for a male shall be five shekels of silver and for your female shall be three shekels of silver. And if it is from six years old and above, if it was a male, then your valuation shall be 15 shekels for a female, 10 shekels. So this was all relating to the work that they could do, that they could produce, not because of their um, sex or age, but because of what they were able to do because of their sex and because of their age. So that's what it's referring to, sexual to the sanctuary. What Rick said is, is exactly right. So hope that clears that up for you. Praise God. Really quick, Brother Rod, I, I don't know if this has any correlation to this, but what you guys talked about in Acts, the, the, the example that you gave there of why uh, they, they were punished as they were because they didn't give the full amount. And we see the same kind of example here where Moshe, he gave the money to them that was redeemed under Aaron and his sons, according to the word of Yahuwah. It says it right there you know, uh, what was commanded. And so I, I'm, I'm thinking that those two may be related in somehow, you know, hmm. kind of bring, bring that back around. Well, th that, that particular, what we read in Acts was, it was in reference to what happened before Ananias and Sapphira gave. They saw, I think it was Nicodemus gave or, I forgot who it was, but in the chap chapter before, they gave a great amount after selling their property for the, the help of the entire community. Well, they did the same thing, but they held back, you know, lying to the Ruach. So um, I don't know if it has anything to do with Moshe and, and, and what he's doing. Well, not necessarily Moshe, but the, the point being that it says that the money that was due to them, you know, uh, according to that word. So, right. Oh, know, yeah, yeah. Yeah. They, they right. Were, if they were going to give, they were supposed to give the right amount, but they didn't. They held held back in that aspect. Absolutely. Yep. Praise God. Well, this concludes our study. Numbers chapter three will be in Numbers chapter four next week. So read ahead so we can have a, a good and healthy discussion. Praise God. And, uh, Shabbat Shalom. Toto Roba. Praise Abba Yah from whom all Baraka flow. We hope this video encouraged you today. Don't forget to study to show yourself approved and be like the Bereans who tested everything. According to 2 Timothy 3.15 and Acts 17.11, we assemble every Shabbat and during the week with like-minded believers all over the world, virtually, and sometimes we gather in person for feast days. We have something for the whole family, including children. Discover more on our website at assemblyofyahuwah.com where you can apply to join, give the biblical assembly needs, including our new land vision, and find many biblical resources to help you grow in your walk with Yah. To know when we publish new videos, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Jeremiah 33 3 tells us, call to Yahuwah and he will answer you, and tell you great and unsearchable things you do not know. Much alone.